Hello, everyone, and welcome to our newest episode of Relative Pitch. We are so, so, so excited to have our wonderful panelists from our GMEA um, presentation. First of all, if you, before you even continue this video, I need you to go back about two episodes ago and actually go watch the GMEA presentation because that was something was not to be missed. So if you missed out, go ahead and you get caught up there and then this will all make sense. So I'm just so happy to see all these wonderful faces here joining us today. Um, so how is everyone? How is everyone doing in February about to be March? Everybody's good and good spirits and everything. I know Georgia right now is getting ready for Allstate. Um, Y'all's kids are hopefully all getting ready for Allstate and everything. Uh-oh, there we go. So, um, Dr. Turner, what are you up to up in good old Canada? Well, actually, I'm, I'm uh, hi, everybody. It's wonderful to see you and uh, honored to be welcome back. Um, I'm actually at uh, our little cottage, which is on Georgian Bay, um, and uh, tuning in from there, and then I'll make the drive back to Waterloo, where uh, I have to go, you know, work. <laughs> So how far is that? How many hours? About two, yeah, about two hours from, from Waterloo. Oh. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Yeah. All through beautiful farm country, Mennonite country. It's just, it's a gorgeous drive. Love that. Love that. Yeah. Um, and then Cecilia, how is things in Georgia teaching and everything? Oh, it's going great. You know, I mean, we're doing our thing. We uh, just are wrapping up the end of a week off. So, you know, it was nice to, you know, have family time and, and some downtime to kind of, you know, re-energize and renew and, and reconnect with folks. You know, we get so busy in our world, you, you know, you don't make time to just sit down and chat with a friend. So it was nice to be able to do that. And then this weekend I'm like ready to go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> meetings, plans, itineraries for spring trips and LGPE and, you know, all state is coming up this weekend. So just a lot of March is a very exciting time. Um, and it's gonna, it's gonna be hard. It'll be a, a good push um, from, you know, tomorrow through to the next break. So good stuff though. And Walton, how are you? How is everything? I know you're traveling. How is things for you? Uh, going great. Similar to uh, Cecilia, I'm coming off of a week off. Uh, so I was in Virginia for the week. I uh, just got off the plane. So uh, same idea. Going to use this afternoon to kind of get things back in gear and get ready for LGPE and the rest of the year. Okay, booked and busy. I know, right? Just all right, <laughs> traveling, getting those fly miles. Okay. Um, and then Sheldon, how are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Coming off of this break, you know, this the the last day is always a little bittersweet, you know. Mm -hmm. But exciting to go back into school tomorrow. So it never ends. Keep on rolling. I will have to say, I have students who I'm teaching who they're like, we're on break right now. I'm like, break for what? Wait a minute, because I don't remember this. Where are my where are my reparations from not getting these breaks whenever I was in high school? Where was this? <laughs> Well, that's because you was over there in Augusta. Because over here in Middle Georgia, we had these breaks. We had these breaks. So you in Augusta. I guess we were learning. I guess we were learning. Apologies. Apologies. Uh, <laughs> so we wanted to have a part two of our GMEA because we had so many questions that we just did not have time for. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and get into these questions. And like always, we are going to be giving our real opinion on these um, topics and you know we would love to hear what you have to say down below so please comment or whatever and we would love to just talk with you so first question that really comes up is actually going to be um, for uh, Wilson um, this question was actually for you um, it says what would be your response to a student this was a sixth grader who asked why everyone in the marine band video is white Maybe the answer is to find videos that feature diversity that could be my fault as well as the teacher. Um, so what would you say, what would be some of your advice for that? And this could go for anybody else too. And my connection is kind of in and out, but I believe the question was, what would my response be to a sixth grader that asked about the race of the Marine Band? Yeah. Ooh, that's heavy. Um, I've had something similar occur before, 
Um, in my wind surfing class, I would always start class with a five to seven minute video of professionals playing. And just in that particular week, I think the first three days were predominantly white ensembles. Um, and I actually played the Marine Band. And, uh, and I asked a pretty generic question. I said, what is something um, significant about what you see? And uh, I had a baseball up there and said, well, everybody's white. Um, and I'm not sure how I responded to that. Uh, I think that's something that has to be handled delicately and maybe, I'm not sure what my answer would be in the moment. I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I, I think that's something I would like, let the student know, hey, I, I would like to discuss that with you after class or something along the lines of that. But I, 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 I don't think I would just miss an opportunity to um, have a meaningful, meaningful discussion with just saying the first thing in my mind. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. There's so many The last thing I want to do, I'm sorry. Oh, the last thing I want to do, the last thing I want to do is misrepresent what's actually occurring and have the student have this delusion as if everyone is starting from the same plane and this is just what happens to be the racial makeup of the Marine Band. I wouldn't want to do that. Um, however, it's, it's, it's a complex answer. So I, I'd have to, I'd need some time on it. That's really interesting because I think for me being a student uh, and still being a current student, but also having been not too far removed um, from that, that age group and where I was kind of unaware up to a certain degree of what was kind of going on in that instance. Um, yeah, I it, it came to a point, I think I was leaving for my first ever like uh, international master class or something that was it was going to be a lot of different people from a lot of different places. And I remember I was like the day before I was having a lesson to leave and my my uh, a t a teacher at the time, you know, she was she was an, um, a person of color, but she was like one of my literally four years of teaching. I was like she was basically like another mom to me at that point. Um, and she basically was like, so something I want to mention before you go is that when you go to this master class or, you know, this festival, you might notice that you may be one of the only um, black students who are there. And she told me that, and it wasn't like something that like, I was like, what, you know, but it was something that like, it did take, it take, like, it took a moment for me to like, understand what she was saying. And she also mentioned like, she was like, but I, the biggest thing I want you to understand is that you do belong there and that you are just as capable of being there. You earned your spot there just like everybody else did. And so don't let that factor get into your head. And I'm so glad she did say that because I got there and that's exactly kind of what happened. I was seeing people who were coming from Chicago, LA, all these places. And I was the only black student at that entire festival. And it w I got into my head so bad about it because I was like, why am I even supposed to be here? I really did not feel like I belong. I remember calling my mom that night, the first night and kind of crying and being like, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. Like I felt out of place, right? But from what my mom told me, you know, she had the the talk, you know, and um, from what my teacher had told me the day before, you know, or like before I had left for the trip, I kind of had to really get out of my head. And I started just allowing myself to soak in the information that was kind of going on and like kind of let myself open up. And some of those people, I, they're still like, we're still chat and like Facebook and Snapchat today, Instagram, all that, like, we still have that connection because I remember how when I did open up and just understand the situation, but embraced it and go, okay, I'm the only one here. Who cares? Let's go. You know, um, that was kind of a turning point for me. And it, that, that mindset, like those things came back up during undergrad because I was a senior in high school when that happened. Um, and so I, I completely understand what you're saying. And like from that perspective, it's hard because you don't know if you're ever really ready for that conversation, but you have to or you know, you might have a student who goes to one of these uh, these um, camps or festivals and they get they get hit with that and they have no idea where to go, you know, from no. that. None. I think Wilson has his, do you have your hand up, Wilson? Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I put in the chat, I put in quotes the talk. Um, so I think the talk is easier to have based on the dynamics of your school. Um, a lot of times if you're in a lower socioeconomic situation, Students have been having the talk since they were in elementary school, yes. you know, but sometimes when you're in affluent areas that 
are filled with minority students. They're not quite as um, aware of some of those dynamics. So that's something to consider uh, when approaching the talk. Yeah. And it's funny because as I was listening to Lauren, probably we're, we're all the same age, but four years later, I was a senior in college at a, uh, at a workshop um, being the only black person there. I mean, I remember feeling the same thing of like, am I supposed to be here? Or the question really comes up, was I only picked because I'm black? Or was I, all, was I picked because I fit, I, I fit into that category that they needed to put on a poster, which a year later, I saw my face on their poster as being, um, you know, the what? And, and it was only because um, I was reading the comments. And mind you, I love this organization. I really do. But I was reading the comments and a lot of comments was like, so where are your women conductors? Where are your Black, you know, your POC conductors? Mm -hmm. And then here I am. My face is the next promo that comes out. And I was like, that's interesting. That's very interesting. So, but, but growing up, I always had that talk. My parents always said, you know, this is what it looks like. And then honestly, just experience. Um, I know as a person coming up, I, my band directors used to show videos of the Marine bands and all these bands and I would look to see. And to this day, when I'm at a GMA performance or any performance, I look in the ensemble and I find people of color. I, I At Midwest, I was looking in the ensemble, looking, I'm counting because I know if it's more than five or six, I'm like, wow, okay. But but honestly, it's sad because there's only been a couple where I could get, I can do two hands or more. And, that, and that's really sad. So I just want to put that out there. I remember uh, one of my first experiences was in high school. Like I went to a middle Georgia high school. Not, there was some diversity, but not a lot. And I went to JanFest and Benjamin E. Mays High School was performing. And I was like, that's cool. I like that. And then I went back to my band and I was like, God, we're like milk. <laughs> okay, like, are we doing something wrong? Like, what's the difference? Like, cause we didn't have like, we had a population, but it was, just, and it was a phenomenal performance. The sound me and Anthony quoted on this, like at GMA when they performed just the sound that that ensemble made. And it's just like, yes, but I was lucky enough to see that in high school and not have to wait to college. But that's just like, how many times did they perform in front of like that thing? How many bands like Benjamin E. Mays are chosen? So I was lucky enough for that, but not everybody is, especially from middle to South Georgia. Cynthia. Yeah, I want to get back to the sixth grade kid. Um, you're, you're, you're 11 or 12, right? In, in sixth grade, and you've probably already had the, some of the talks, I, I would suspect. I mean, your experience, Lauren, was, was uh, unfortunate, but fortunately you had a wonderful mom and a wonderful band director who, who prepared you for that so that you, when you walked into that situation and at first you were, you know, freaked out and imposter syndrome and why am I here? And then your chest and your head was held high. Like, I'm, I'm here because I belong here. Not every, not every kid has that, you know, that experience, that, that kind of mentorship that's, that's available. I mean, I think it's, I don't know, Wilson, I think for you to be so reflective on what you would say to that kid in the moment is really, really cool. But I think it, it's also an opportunity to say, well, let's, let's talk about the Marine Band and upper echelons of the military and upper, upper echelons in general and who, who are the gatekeepers and who, do you, who gets in and why do they get in and, get in and how, does that, how does that system all work? Um, and you could have that complicated conversation, but also say things are changing, right? I mean, they're very slowly, uh, but they are changing. So I really like Cecilia's comment right off the bat was, get your butt in the practice room, right? And, and, and you can be there too, right? But it's about who has access. Um, it's a big part of it. And I'll have to say a plug in also just um, having organizations now like Sphinx and the National African American Wind Symphony now, like we're going to start having recording or already do have recordings now 
where we can show our kids the standards of if we want to, you know, or whatever pieces you're working on that you are like, okay, we want to use this in, in programming or whatever. And you could like have ensembles that do show diversity and everything um, like for that. And I think that's amazing. I just wanted to plug those two organizations because that's become an amazing thing that I wish was around, um, I guess, during early years of my own education. So. And the last question I want to plug in on the back of this, like, we, if we're going beforehand and planning this, we can do a good job of maybe finding groups that are more diverse. But if you're in the moment, hey, let me pull up this march to show you what a march sounds like, and you click on the first recording because you know they're going to play the march correctly, like then what do you do when you like have like 30 seconds to find a video? Mm. Like, do you just like not show the video and try to explain it, or do you show a video and not in risk, but like that question might pop up? And so like, that's, I think, I think, I think that's maybe where this com this comment came from is like, she was like throwing it up in the, like she threw up a video of a uh, March. It was like, click. And then the comment came. So like how in the moment, very fast, can we um, maybe find a different group? Are we like looking at that? Cause we're all focused on the teaching part of like, let me get this, how to play a March. So I was trying to like, what would y'all say about that? I'd get the Marine band to try and do some hip hop and they wouldn't do it very well. Right. I mean, so that's part, of, that's part of the I shouldn't say that. I mean, I, I, Colburn's going to kill me, but, you know, like it, 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 it's partly the history of the march. Yeah. Right. Which yeah. is a fundamentally racialized uh, style of music. So um, but that that's not to say that Benjamin E. Mays won't play a march off, you know, out of this world good. So it, it's it's partly the historical and the context. And, and I just I, I think that, you know, teachers that are here um, learning from your podcast and who are um, interested uh, in being more intentional just have to plan better. <laughs> I mean, because yes, the quick answer is to, you know, put it in YouTube and do a search and click Marine Band, but um, you've got to know that that's what it's going to look like. And if you are intentional in the, you know, the posters that go up around your room or the videos that you share with your students or the ensembles or soloists that you give as examples, for, for great performers, then you have to do a little extra work to educate yourself and, and be able to open the their eyes to those, um, because they exist, but it's super easy. Go to Army Band, Marine Band, Air Force Band. You know, we know that we can count on North Texas, that we can count on um, Eastman, that we can count on Tokyo Kasai, um, but just do a little bit of research if it's important to you. And have a, um, I'll always say, just have a, a um, if you are going to show these things, be ready to have that conversation as well. Be ready to, if a kid asks, why does it look like this? Be ready to have that conversation. Just, and this goes with any video you show. I mean, I, every Tuesday in my class, we have choir listening activity where I put up a choir and we listen to it. Um, but if any questions of like, why do they look like this? Why did they do that? I've done my research to be like, well, this is why yada, yada, yada. So be ready for any questions to come up about anything you put up on that screen, because these kids will ask. They definitely, definitely will ask. Um, and which leads us to our, our next question, um, uh, which is going to go to Sheldon. Um, so this question asks, how do you connect with the composition, even if your experience does not match the experience that the piece represents? What will be, and anybody else can also answer. Well, I do exactly what I think um, I ask my students to do, and that's use my imagination. Uh, for the longest time up to... Um, I, for the longest time uh, in my career in regards to learning a score, engaging with it, I kind of have to put myself in someone else's shoes almost as if I'm reading a history book or almost as if I'm reading a storybook that I, you know, just as I'm reading, I remember my first, the first big book I read when I was a kid was Dr. Doolittle. I was so, I don't know if y'all remember, uh, anyone do something called accelerated reading? You might remember that? No? Yeah. And so you had to take the little test and something. Well, it was a big deal because this book was like one of the top points that you could like get, right? And so like, I, it, and I remember it, it like, um, 
that memory kind of stays with me because it was one of the first times that I really like immersed myself in a story. I immersed myself in this, um, uh, um, the this, this story of this, you know, doctor talk to animals. And so I have to do the same thing whenever I'm reading um, a score that I might not necessarily be able to connect with um, easily. Um, I just imagine. Anybody else have any other tips about, you know, just getting out of yourself and, and really just diving into the music? I think a lot of time with music and like connection, I think more, I think of connection in terms of like empathy of being able to like understand and put yourself, like I think someone already said, put yourself in someone else's shoes. So it's not like necessarily you have to have gone through that experience or have lived yourself through that perspective, but to understand um, the, to well to have gone through and like you know do your research and understand the background of whatever the the meaning the story whatever behind the piece is or the composer or both usually hopefully um, I think that's the biggest thing because I don't think you have to have that perspective and this is what the, the same thing when we were on I forgot what episode that was it was just us three and we were talking about like what if a all white choir wants to do a spiritual and I was like that's fine do your research like understand the meaning behind it so it's not saying that you don't have the opportunity to understand you don't you can't it's not saying you can't understand because you haven't lived through that perspective or through that um situation do your research though so i think that you had something well i was just i mean i i, I was just going to reiterate do your research i mean there's i i it, it and it might not be um you're not going to get a hundred percent there, but you're certainly going to get uh, more there, right? I'm, I was I was just researching a piece called La Flor Mas Linda by uh, Gilda Lyons, which and it's it's got uh, Nicaragua Nicaragua in it as and the the students sing it at the end, and I it just I went down a rabbit hole of history of Nicaragua and what these instruments mean and what and and what. <laughs> What, what freedom means and, and defiance against dictators. It's so prescient today, right? I mean, this is um, what's happening in Ukraine and Russia has is, is, is ha happened for centuries. And there's the, this particular music that I'm studying is exactly the same sort of defiance of that strength in numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So it, but it made me really go down a rabbit hole of research into Nicaragua and uh, the instruments that they use and um, this time in history. And um, so it's a long-winded way of saying, uh, do your research. But I also like what you said, Lauren, in, in uh, leading with empathy and researching with empathy and how can I better understand this? And I also love Cecilia, you said, make relevant connections to your own personal experiences. Um, that's a great way to just kind of connect with the music. And so you never kind of feel like, I don't know what I'm talking about. If you relate it to yourself and, it, and that's where that em um, empathy comes from, really get into it first person, really feel that music first person. I like that. Yeah, it, it, I just even, I mean, it's a, you know, we're <laughs> performing Armenian dances. How many of your students have gone to Armenia? How many people could find it on a map? But, you know, to do some of the research and show pictures, but then talk about what it looks like outside your own window, you know, or maybe you do a piece that is about loss and you don't know anyone who was gunned down in their church, but you've experienced personal loss, you know, and, and there's, there's ways to, to, all the things you've said, you know, you do your research and, but then try to, you know, find a way to, to share your own empathy. And sometimes it's because you have to look at your own life and go, this is how I've experienced loss. And that's going to be true for you as the conductor preparing the music. But then also when you want to give your students a really rich, meaningful experience, it's about creating um, that same relevancy for them. And, and drawing those parallels for them so that it is more than just ink on a page and they're able to, to put some of their own 
um, personality, their own emotions into their performance as well. We, we've all been a part of a group that that's kind of gone there before on the stage versus you might do the very same piece with a different group who just isn't well, willing to be vulnerable and they um, don't find those relevant connections and they're just playing ink on a page and it's lovely, but it's not the same life-changing experience as studying and performing a piece can be when you're able to connect it to something that means something to you. Yeah. Um, so we're already, this, que this next question actually is something that a lot of people and even myself have asked, and um, this is going to go to you as well, Cecilia. Um, this question says, as a young band director, programming meaningful and significant repertoire for younger bands is already a bit difficult, meaning like grades one to three, but how can I find and program diverse repertoire for younger groups? It's out there, I promise. <laughs> it really is. Um, and I think more than ever, we're very, very fortunate. Um, for me, as a young band director, uh, 26 years ago, I, I would definitely say that um, there was a very small, and, and we've seen those numbers because they're not reflected on our, our lists yet. Um, but more than ever, it's out there. Yeah, Wilson's absolutely right. Find it. It's it's there. It really, truly is there. There are so many um, organizations like ICD. I'm so proud to be a part of that. And Cindy is as well that are, are amassing those lists. And, you know, Alfred and the minority band directors have amassed pretty com comprehensive lists of African-American composers. Um, the, the, thank you for sharing the website, Cindy. And, and you know, there are so many organizations that are there, that are out there now that are lifting up um, several different kinds of composers and uh, love Jody's work as well. And um, there are now, you know, cohorts of composers who are supporting each other and um, in every kind of media as well as chamber music and not just full bands and um and and so it's it's again it's sort of like i mentioned earlier about being intentional put in the work it, if it's important to you put in the work if you think that it's important for your students to experience it's there ask ask um look for it search whatever it takes because it it's definitely there and it it doesn't have to be on the list <laughs> the dreaded list i was gonna say like i know like i'll get on the phone with anthony after his day of teaching sometimes and i know it's a long day and you and band directors experience a long emotions especially in their first like five years of teaching and it's so easy to go to like jw pepper it's all there they have exhilarating uh descriptions of their music too like this fun and exciting opener in three four will get the crowd rolling and i'm like i understand but we got to do the work. And I know it's, I know it's hard. You've already put in X amount of hours, especially if you're a high school band director, all those marching man hours and stuff. And you get there early to do a zero, zero hour class. But when we put in the work, it is so meaningful to our students and it's so meaningful for them to gain that. And I understand it is hard. Band directors don't kill me. Like I understand you already do X amount of hours a day, but even 30 minutes every other day, or maybe like, I know, wake up early on a Sunday. I know you don't want to and have a great coffee and do like a couple of hours and just find music for a time, but it will be worth it for your students. And then just bookmark those websites. Y'all do the work. I mean, it, it is, you know, it is a fulfilling few days or hours, you know, that you spend here and there, but then just bookmark it. So then when you're looking like, hmm, I really want to do something, just click on, you already have the link and then it's there or join some of the Facebook groups where there are participants who are more aware and you just find those links and, and, and ask. Yes, please. Why didn't mm, Cindy talk about that? Well, I mean, it's it's yes, we we everybody has to do the work, but I'm I'm sympathetic to young band directors who are freaking out, right? As, as in their in their first year and a little bit further. I mean, they don't know this music because they weren't taught this music, and they weren't taught this music because 
<laughs> how higher ed works is that they teach the music that they were taught. I mean, that's that's why higher ed is so slow to change. And so uh, I, I, I think, and it'll take a little bit, you know, it'll take a while, but reach back out to your alma maters, to your music ed professors and say, how come, how come I didn't know about Omar Thomas? How come I didn't know about Kevin Day? How come I didn't know about Jody Blackshaw? What, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How come I didn't know about any more of Bermudas? You know, what's going on? You know, and then, and, and not necessarily in a, you know, accusic, accusatory way, but, uh, you know, here are these composers that I'm learning about that it would be really cool the next generation of music educators would know coming into the profession. So it's, it's kind of like do the work, but also reach back out to your past and, and have them do the work too, right, for the next generation. So um, our next question um, kind of goes off of how do we make sure all of our students, um, whether they're part of the LGBTQ community, um, where, you know, non-binary, all of this, how do we make sure that they feel welcomed in our classes? Um, you know, in high school or middle school, people can be very malicious and just honestly, just they they don't get along sometimes. How can we make sure in our band rooms that, you know, it's a positive environment and we make sure that all of our kids feel safe? And I'm, this is gonna go to Shelby. Uh, modeling, 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 like, like being the um, adult in the room that is vulnerable, that is open to learning about those that have different cultures. I mean, I think it, it, just like teaching music, just like teaching mastery of an instrument, the students have to have a model. They have to have a model uh, that they can uh, um, uh, design their behavior around. And so like, at, at least I can speak from my own experience that a lot of it comes from the fact that I can just, it, it, I think when you become a teacher, you have to, uh, we, we all are in this profession because we want more. We want better for others. We want better for the next generation coming up behind us. And I think that it's um, it, that um, kind of part of us, we've got to continue to carry throughout all of the um, minutia of education. You know, it's very easy to kind of get caught up in you know, the million things that we're, that we are tasked to do, but you're in education because you wanted something better for those um, that come behind you, that came behind you. Your experience was positive enough that you wanted to replicate that. So it's, I think it's important to continue to hold on to the um, altruistic part of us that is always here to make something better for others. So model the behavior, model the behavior, model the behavior, and then off, off, also model making mistakes through that vulnerability. You know, uh, you know, I, I, having moments where you are, you show yourself as not being perfect. You show yourself as not being um, completely um, knowing the right word at the right time. All that's okay. You know, all that is just real. And I think the realer you are, the more students are able to respect you and um, um, model behind your behavior. Uh, and I would say, so some of the things that um, Cindy has just said was like, post a rainbow flag on your office door. Um, so just this past week, I have a rainbow flag that is sitting right next to my podium, um, which has led a student to come out um, to me and everything. And it was honestly, I had tweeted, I was like, I am about to cry right now. Like I'm literally sitting here about to cry. Um, and he was just so happy because his brother's in the military and his brother's coming back. And he was like, I cannot wait to tell him. And I'm just like, I want to cry right Like I really just want to just, you know, ball in tears and everything. And then which led to another student um, coming up and just saying like, hey, Ms. Morris, like, so when is like the best time do you think I should tell my parents? And I was like, do you feel comfortable? Let's engage in this conversation. Then the next day, another student was like, Miss Morris, can I have your rainbow flag? Uh, no, you may not. Okay, look now, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is my rainbow flag. Um, but it, it really opens the door. It really opens the door for many different conversations. So something as small as that really, you know, brings that conversation. So it's a, it's a good feeling, but I was such a ball of mess, y'all. Such a ball of mess. 
It's so cute. It's amazing. Another thing that's small that I was noticing, I think uh, Cindy said it in one of our little, I don't know if it was on camera meeting or off camera meetings, is get rid of all those basic early 2090s posters by Yamaha and Bach and all these ones of just white men holding brass instruments or white men holding a clarinet yeah. and find some new ones. Make some of your own. Like, an inspiration board. These artists inspire me. Your students are going to be like, who is that? You get to educate them on somebody. You get to show them, introduce them to somebody new, like Kamazi Washington, for example, um, and some uh, many other people that are not coming to my brain right now. But like, get rid of those posters. I know they fill up your space. They make you look like you know what's up. But the minute you get rid of those and throw up something new, they'll start looking at your walls again instead of being like, I've seen him. Every time I crack this B flat, I look at him. It's great. Also, use your students, your your past students that have either went to college or, you know, have been doing some great things. Maybe they started their own band or something like that. Get them to do like a little, little promo. Honestly, it's kind of going back and forth right there. You can say, oh, yeah, that student played clarinet when they were in sixth grade and through eighth grade. And then they went to high school and look what they're doing now. Like so. And then that gets kids involved and invested now that they know that somebody who said where they are are currently doing some very very big things just change that rhetoric change that rhetoric there oh another group Amani oh, wins oh so my gosh course. Midwest if you weren't at their concert in Midwest you, you missed, missed it. you missed it that was everything 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 I, I use them as so like reference videos for so many of my classes and my students because they're just phenomenal and their presence like their energy that they give off can't nowhere else nowhere <laughs> else Hashtag monica is the truth monica monica oh is the truth and the outfit uh, yeah always coming always coming to slay always Love coming her. To slay. um so we, we've talked about a lot of this of what we do in our band programs. Um, but this next question is something that um, is a very, very, I guess, uh, a kind of a thing over all of our heads. And the question is, how do you handle pushback from administration or closed-minded community for what they might perceive as a political statement and discourage us from promoting DEI within our classroom and rehearsals? Um, so this is targeted to everybody. So I kind of want to hear what everybody has to say. So I, 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 I have a, a, a story, story time, okay. um, because what you're describing in this question just happened in California, California Allstate. So um, Kevin Day was um, and Katya Copley were, were commissioned to write pieces on a Black Lives Matter curriculum. So uh, when, when George Floyd was murdered and the, there was uh, the Black Lives protests, California sort of got together, the band directors and the, the association said, we've got, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And they devised a whole curriculum, uh, uh, um, which I admittedly haven't seen, but what part of it was commissioning Kevin Day to write a piece called Requiem. It was called Requiem for the Unarmed. Uh, and um, Kaches was, um, so this is heaven or something about, I can't remember, for the middle school and Kevin for the top group at, at California. And uh, COVID happened. So it was, it was sort of, it was postponed for a year. And then the music went out a few weeks before we were to start rehearsal. So I just came back from California and uh, Kevin um, called me and said, uh, I'm, I, I'm pulling the piece. I'm, I'm not going to California. What's going on? Uh, well, there's been uh, parents and some band directors that have complained that the piece is political. You're using the California Allstate uh, to make a political statement. And so the, um, there was, as you can imagine, tremendous amount of Kevin was devastated and to the point where he wanted to pull the piece. And, you know, who am I to say, but I said, Kevin, let me speak to the, to the organizers. Uh, who were amazing uh, and also uh, deeply troubled by this very loud few people. Um, the result of the whole thing, it's a very long story that I will make maybe longer <laughs> than it needs to be, I don't know, but I'll try to make it short, is that the, the, this is the work, right? This, this is the work and the, 
the Kevin's piece had some uh, had some words in it. The students were were to chant, and so did Katja's piece. Uh, the end result is that those words were were removed. Um, and uh, but before they were removed, I said, "Look, this is not political. This is art making, which is a reflection of society. Period. Right? You don't have to agree with it." Uh, or you you can agree with it, but if if art is not a reflection and a response to society, what's what is it? Uh, and to have that conversation with the students, the band parents, and and the and the few band directors that were upset. But curiously, and, and we were prepared to have that. It was Kevin that removed the words. And the fascinating thing about it is that it was a more powerful piece without them. Um, so, I mean, that that's sort of an aside. It was a it was sort of a happy ending to what was really a disgusting process uh, and a very interesting process. But it, it's not like this this situation that Lauren has put in the chat that where administrators will will perceive something as a political statement isn't happening every day today uh, post Black Lives Matter post you think that this stuff isn't happening and it, and it is. So um, yes, being prepared to have that, that conversation for sure, but also making the statement that it's not a political statement. Art is a reflection of society. Boom. Okay, I'm settled. <laughs> Welcome um, back. Now, what I was saying is uh, one, I'd prepare for it and I'd arm myself with as much information as possible and get um, the stakeholders to understand that, you know, this, this piece wouldn't be setting a new precedent. You know, chances are the students have played uh, similar pieces that have historical context. You know, if you're playing Shostakovich, if you're playing, like there are reasons why this music has been written. So this wouldn't be something that's new. Um, and it always helps with administrators to have standards that align with your curriculum. So I'd be uh, sure to uh, make that um, as clear as possible as well. I have a, a follow up question for, you know, um, everybody else that say you've done all this, you've, you've given your case to the people that are above you and they still say no. Is this a thing where you're like, okay, I know I should not be here anymore and it's time for me to go. Or would you say, okay, maybe this was a no, but maybe in the future, you know, something like it could come above. Is this something to fight for long-term or to go protect your sanity, to protect, you know, yourself um, in a different space? So um, Cecilia, what, what about um, <laughs> that? I was like, please don't ask me, please don't ask me. <laughs> I, no, I, you know, I, I have not had that experience. I, like when when Cindy just shared her story about California Allstate, all of the, you know, I, I, I'm sitting here in my, you know, little, my house here in Georgia, looking at all the Facebook posts about the California Allstate and everything seems so positive. I was like, man, I want to go. <laughs> you know, I see all of my Asian colleagues, you know, because there are several more of them in California than in Georgia. I'm like a little bit jealous, you know, but then I hear that and I think, Oh my gosh. Okay. This is really happening. Um, I haven't dealt with it personally, but I'm going to, I'm going to say this. I don't ask. I am not the sort of director that asks for permission to do something that I think is good for kids. You know, the day after the Super Bowl. Um, at our school, we have something called buck block, right? And so every day there's like a 30 minute block that's supposed to, you know, in some way enhance what you're doing, right? So on Mondays, I see my ninth grade, like concert band students again for a second time. And the day after the Super Bowl, they came in and they were seated and I clicked play on the screen and a kid said, oh, we have to watch that, that guy take a knee again. And I looked at him and I said, or you could just enjoy the good show. Like, I don't even like, I'm not here to talk about politics with you. Like, unless that's 
Like I didn't play that for them for a political purpose. I played it for them because it was a great production. And I wanted to talk about production quality. And um, sometimes we can program music with the purpose of bringing that conversation up, but also because it's great music. I don't think we can have a conversation about, you know, good music and separate from that music that makes a political statement. I hope that what you're choosing to play with your group is really good music, regardless of the composer's inspiration. So that in my mind is enough reason to bring a piece to the stage. And if we, I think I talked about this when we did GMEA together, like if you approach background history and how you um, teach a piece to your students, if you do that consistently, then it shouldn't have to be a separate parade for a cause because it's just, it's sort of how we always study music. And sometimes the topics are more sensitive and sometimes it's about child abuse or racial inequality or violence and those conversations will come up. But I still ultimately picked that piece because it was a piece that I wanted my students to study for its musical merit. And, and I know that that's, that's Cecilia's own personal opinion, I, here's my disclaimer, you know, we, we, you know, are just who we are and what we have to do. But I guess that's why maybe I've never run into pushback because I don't, I don't ask. And I teach music the same way, regardless of um, its content or inspiration. Sheldon, do you have anything on this yeah, I, I was just trying to recall a time that I've had had to have this conversation or kind of get close to it. And I just kind of call it what it is. There was a time I was at a a, a football game and um, it was during halftime, you know, during halftime, you split between the two bands and we did our, our performance. And then I think the other band did their performance as well. And there I didn't watch the show too closely, but there was something I, they, were, I think they were doing some kind of like uh, like senior tradition or something like that. And a rainbow flag came out at some point. I, I didn't think anything of it. Um, fast forward to the next Monday, I get an email or I get a phone call from um, an administrator about a phone call that they got from a parent saying um, how inappropriate what it was for there to be a rainbow flag on the field, blah, 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 blah. Um, And even though the band, it wasn't, you know, we weren't the ones that did it. I kind of said, okay, the, the administrator that was talking to me said, well, just so you know, you know, we're not, we won't, uh, you're not authorized to wave any kind of flag other than like the American flag or whatever, whatever, or something like that. And I said, um, so that's all, that's all fine. Good. But just so I know that I can speak to the parents, uh, my students' parents that, uh, uh, or the parents of my of my gay and lesbian students, just so I'm aware, just so I know what to tell them, you want me to in no way represent them on the field or in any in any capacity of what we're doing. There's a percentage of my band that you want to be silenced. I just need to know what to say to my parents. I just need I just need to know you give me the vocabulary there. Um and it's well well, 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 well you know that kind of thing. You know, after after I say that, but I just I'm just very honest with you. I'm like, hey, you know, you if if you have enough gall to talk to me about it, then you let me know what I need to tell, talk to my parents who are who have a loved one with the voice that you're trying to silence in one way or another. That just keeps it real. Like, it's what it is, team. Keep it real. Keep it real. I love that, especially when you come back at administrator and they're then they just go on that whole little blah, 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 blah. You're like, got you. I got you right then and there. So it's always good to have those couple of moments. Um, and to wrap up our post-GMEA Q&A, um, this is our last question, um, in which it is, I am a straight white male and I feel like my students all receive my perspective. How do I make sure my students receive a well-rounded teaching? 
Um, so what are some ways, I mean, we've given a lot in both part one and part two GMEA, but what are like the big things that you can just say, try this and this will make it better? I think more than anything, like just even eliminating the first part of that, just saying, how do I make sure my students, no matter like who I am, like are receiving a well-rounded education, period. Period. That's the answer. That's the answer right there. Simple <laughs> as that. Diversify who you put in front of the group, diversify who you bring in, um, and diversify literature as much as possible. But again, it, you know, doesn't matter who you are, that uh, your goal should be, you know, diversifying their experience. <laughs> like I would also have to yeah. say <laughs> one other thing on top of that, be truly authentic in what you, in what you are doing. Be truly authentic because students and me being a, one of those students, I can tell when you are really BSing. I, I can see through it. So truly be intentional and genuine with your love for music, your love for the kids. If the kids feel that, then that's really, really what matters. And show them that you're learning too and that you are still a student in your own like area you know i love to like telling my students i just did all of this research last week on this composer and i wanted to share it with you they're like that's so cool like yes it is and show them that you are so capable at your age whatever age that is of growing and learning and progressing that and that that will bring diversity it's just going to naturally happen when, when you continue learning the more you learn the more you know um and one last thing before we go um Cecilia, i think you have one little follow-up about the list. I, I really appreciate, again, just being a part of this group of people. I I learned so much, you know, you're talking about Sheldon's just talking about being, staying curious. I, I learned so much every time we get together and I think that's such an important part of this process. And um, at the GMEA convention, um, I was very direct about my feelings regarding our state list specifically. And I, I asked if I could take this opportunity to apologize to Audrey Murphy and the members of the GMEA Music Selection Committee um, because I misspoke. I um, went on record to say that there is not a system in place for the in the state of Georgia uh, for composers to submit their work for um, consideration and inclusion on our state list. Um, it was something that Cindy and I in a, a panel that we were a part of at GMEA a year ago was a concern that we spoke to and uh, Audrey, um, took over as chair of the committee this school year. And the very first thing that she recommended to GMEA was that we change that. And they have agreed to creating a place for composers to be able to submit their work for consideration um, for that committee to review annually. Um, they'll follow the same timelines as directors who want to submit work to be considered for addition to that list. And I know that Audrey is working diligently with a GMEA leadership to make it a visible place on the GMEA website, not buried somewhere in Opus, which you know our GMEA directors know what it's like trying to access Opus and use Opus. They want to give it a place of prominence on the GMEA website so that comp composers of, um, of all backgrounds will, will be able to submit. So I just wanna say thank you to that committee and to Audrey for her leadership and my sincerest apologies for not being better informed prior to our presentation at GMEA. And that's, I think, I mean, in the chat, everyone's like reacting so positively to that. And that's, it's amazing because this is what we want, right? This is what we're fighting for. Like whenever we are talking about these issues and raising the issues, actually seeing things being implemented and initiatives being done to like fix those or ha make solutions or make those situations better. That's what we're doing. So um, kudos to the people who made that happen. And I mean, that's, that's awesome. Cool. Jimmy, nice. One point for you.
It, it, is, it is awesome. It's fantastic. And it's curious. I don't know, in Cecilia, in your conversations, whether they decided to just sort of do that quietly or they decided to announce it. Um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, did, did they amplify what they were doing or they just sort of did it quietly? And, and if that's the case, why? Which is because that's also an interesting conversation, not to because it can have unintended consequences. But it, I'm curious in your conversations how that played out. And, and that and that was something and that's why I was very quick to apologize when Audrey brought it to my attention. I thought, you know, shame on us for not doing a better job of researching to know that that had actually changed. Um, I don't remember receiving any kind of email notification. And, you know, our chairs and, and officers are, are pretty good about sending out emails that say, hey, here's, you know, here's some updates about whatever, an event or, you know, auditions and things like that. I hadn't seen any of those emails. And after we had a phone conversation on Saturday of GMEA, I went back and I just deep dived. I clicked on everything on the website and couldn't find it and contacted her and said, please, I want to get this corrected. I want to get the word out. Tell me how to do it. And she actually discovered that GMEA didn't follow up on her initial email, um, which, you know, we've had this conversation, uh, you know, at our 845 session during conference, you know, that, um, that, you know, we used to have a diversity standing committee at GMEA and it, um, the, the chair, who was one of my Filipino colleagues at the time, he just stepped down because he said, I, what, I, I, I'm just holding my title. You don't actually want me to do anything. Um, and, and now it's back. So there, I, I, I think that we also are about to have some leadership changes and, uh, you know, through our election, but also just in, a, you know, some changes in the central office that I hope that more folks like us and like Audrey and her team, um, will stand up for change for all of the kids in Georgia. That's, yeah, let me take that point back. That I gave Look, I can't let me just um, But it. I wanna, that's a, a, that's, it brings up a slight topic of accessibility because what's the point of having all the resources and all the other things and the, the opportunities when you're not amplifying them and when you're not actually putting it out there for, for people to know and to use and to have access to. So it's just not enough to say, oh, we have this, but not even say, like, you know, do, but then share it. Because some people don't, don't, can't dive or don't know how to deep dive and find those opportunities. So make it accessible, make it accessible. That is like a retweet for that. I can't find a way around a Word Excel sheet sometimes. Like there's a lot of people that are like me who are band directors who are like very technology challenged. Like if it is not like, boom, bam. I hit you in the face, bam. Then we ain't gonna see it. And we I need it, bam. Like give it to me. Please give it to me. And y'all have the right marketing people to push that. Right, you, they have marketing people. You have those people to do it, so use them. And I hate and I hate because sometimes this can turn into Jimmy A just needs, you know, redo some things. But my but what I remember when you when you first let us know about this. At first, I was like, oh, that's good. And then I got very upset when I found out that a committee said, this is what we're going to do. And the GMEA as an institution was like, oh, that's cute. Mm, but we're not going to do anything about it. Like, we're not even going to really put this on, you know, they didn't even take the time to do a link. Do you know how easy it is to create a link nowadays? Like, oh, my goodness. So. It. It's exactly so like at first it was great and i'm glad that the committee that um Audrey murphy is on that they really came up with that they thought about it i am so glad um but whoever is that gmea conglomerate or whatever shame on you shame on you because you do better first of all, you're do better people that is trying to make this organization better is trying to but you are still um halting their progress and that right there is what make the rest of us very angry. So again, I take my clap back. 
gatekeeping. Anyway, so <laughs> this was fun. Hi, I'm, so, I'm so happy that we got to do this. Um, and thank you all so much again. Like, I mean, every time, like Cecilia mentioned, every time we're together, we we learn so much from each other and we just have a great time just being in each other's presence. So thank you for this and thank you for sharing your time with us and our audience and your knowledge. And um, we just, we can't thank you enough for being a part of this journey with us. And um, to our guests, we really hope, or our, um, not our guests, that's you guys, and to our audience, <laughs> we really hope you enjoy these conversations. Let us know what you, what, what you think about everything. There was a lot that was talked about and unfolded between all the conversations and the questions. So let us know. We, we love to interact and to have more of these conversations. So um, again, if you haven't listened to our GMA recording, go back and listen to it. A lot of this will make sense and tie in to the things we already discussed in that and the conversations we're going to continue to have because you know it's it's not an overnight thing it's not it's a day-to-day -day progression and it's going to take time so thank you for being a part of this with us and uh we look forward to seeing y'all next week stay safe bye Hello.